Welcome to those of you watching on YouTube. This is Blowing Smoke with Twisted Rico. I'm your host, Steve Ricardo. If you want to hear this entire show with intros, outros, and music, please go to Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, etc. All right, please welcome back to the show, Jonathan Anastas. How are you, Jonathan? Great to be here. Thanks for having me back. <laughs> And we have a very special occasion that we're going to talk about today. So that's uh, before we get to that, though, I want to ask you um, about Dave, because it's it's all, you know, everyone knows now that he's not doing well. How, I mean, can you give us some kind of an update? Is he all right? Our friend, Dave. I'll give you an update. Dave Smalley is a very private person, and I, I've actually encouraged him to be more public about this as we all get older and we all struggle with with health stuff because I, I i think he would love to hear you know from the world of music how beloved he is and how important he's been to people but dave started with a struggle with cancer in the summer and for people who are watching closely don't sleep one of his other bands had to cancel their august uh european tour because of his health situation and Dave and I are in touch all the time. And he ensured me the treatment was going very well and he'd be ready for the DYS shows in the fall. And last time you and I talked, we hadn't been ready to announce this, but we put together a very limited amount of reunion shows to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Brotherhood record and to be announced, now announced 40th anniversary release on Bridge Nine. And unfortunately, as the band was beginning rehearsals in California to prepare for those shows and just, you know, a little bit of housekeeping for people don't know, DYS is based in Los Angeles with the exception of Dave these days. Yeah. And so what we've done for the last decade is the band workshops everything and the band rehearses. And then we do a couple days with Dave and then we do our shows or whatever. And the band was rehearsing for these shows and unfortunately, in the process of his treatment, Dave got one of those very serious viruses that you kind of only can get in a hospital setting. And, you know, one of those super bugs. Staph you know, infection or them. something like that? I don't necessarily want to get into details, but the sort of the kind of like very serious infection you can, yeah. that generally only, you know, happen to people in a hospital setting. It's horrible. And he was very, very, very ill. And unfortunately, we had to cancel the shows. And the good news up until that point had been his cancer treatment was going very well. And things were looking very good. And this was an unfortunate, unplanned setback. And it was quite serious. And then it started to look better. And he recently had another setback, unfortunately. And so Dave remains hospitalized, which, you know, is is, is very... Very sad for me as his friend of 40 years and, you know, and we just, you know, sometimes shows have to get canceled and that's terrible. And sometimes press cycles around record releases have to get canceled. That's life. The most important thing to me is Dave's health is my friend of 40 years. And so we're doing everything we can to make sure that he gets healthy. Wow. Well, thank you for that update. And uh, I know some of the proceeds from the re-release are going to go towards his medical expenses. All of the profits from the re-release are going to go to his medical expenses. We That's may great. reach the point where there might need to be a benefit show. That That's all TBD. But, you, you know, Dave is, again, without getting into too much of Dave's business as a private person, you know, Dave is very lucky in a country where everybody doesn't have you know, sufficient health insurance to have health insurance. He's got solid health insurance. But I think for anybody who's dealt with health issues themselves or health issues mm -hmm. with friends or family members or parents, even in the best health care in America, it's like 80 20 for things like this. Yeah. And for serious, for serious, you know, health situations, even have an insurance company cover 80% of your expenses can leave significant bills. Before we go all the way back, to the recording of the record. You may have brought this up when we talked before, but can you just tell us how you and Dave actually met? Do you remember when you first met Dave Smalley? I absolutely remember. So the funny thing is, is like a, a lot of 
issues from this era go back to Newbury Comics. So I was working after school at Newbury Comics. Dave, you know, Newbury Comics was, you know, the original location on Newbury Street was, you know, the center of a lot of alternative music happening back then. And Dave and I had sort of independently put messages up on, you know, sort of the message board there about wanting to put a band together. And Dave said that he had a drummer and I said that I had a guitar player. And if this whole gelling situation had worked, we would have had a full band. And we had a couple of rehearsals. Interestingly, I think the first rehearsal we had was at Gallery East, not Gallery East. It was at the Media Workshop itself. Um, and over a very short period of time, it became clear that A, Dave's drummer wasn't particularly talented. And the guitar player that I brought to the table, while very talented, wasn't particularly interested in playing this sort of music. And so that original four became a very different four, but that is how Dave and I originally met. So it was from an ad that you put up on the wall at Newberry Comics. Yeah. And then very quickly, we realized that Dave and I were both going to, you know, SSD shows and gangrene shows. And, you know, this is in the very early nucleus of the Boston crew and the whole thing gelled. So did you turn guys turn into a 40 year friendship? You know, yeah, did you did you guys together meet the SSD and the Boston crew guys? Did you meet them together or was that one of you before the other? Not at the same time. I believe Dave met them before I did. I think there was a summer where I was it's sort of the summer where everything happened for the first time, the first SSD show, the first black flag show. I was at summer camp in Maine. And so I missed out the first few. And here's the, here's the irony. I was at summer camp in Maine with Henry Rollins, who was not yet in black flag. <laughs> wow. Really? Wow. Really? That's good. Did you and Henry like, no, did you, did you know each other back then or were you just, no, Henry and I very much knew each other, and we continued to write each other after summer camp. Wow, you didn't mention this the last time we talked. That's pretty cool. So you were probably, what, 15 or something? I was something like that. I was 14 or 15. Henry was a couple of years older than I was. Interestingly, Patrick Dempsey, the actor, was also at summer camp during that period, same summer camp. Wow, that is really cool. And, and, and Willie Garrison, the actor who was on uh, Sex in the City. Wow, what a what a gathering, man. That's pretty cool. Wow. Well, I just wanted to get uh the Dave thing together. Um, okay, I want you to just tell me all about the well, first of all, I have a question. Wolfpack, right? Which wasn't on the Brotherhood record. Um, there's two versions of that, I believe. One was a demo version and one's a radio version. Now, was that be that's before Brotherhood you recorded? Both of those or one of those? No. So the original recording of Wolfpack was the first thing DYS ever recorded. Right. Pre-Wolf, pre-Wolfpack. And in the strange decisions D DIY bands who know nothing about music and nothing about the music business make, one of the decisions we made was not to initially record Wolfpack for the Brotherhood record because we'd already done that. You know, it, it, it's funny. In a normal world, like, you know, you're smiling, you went on and worked at major labels and figured out how to do things sort of the way that things were done. Normally, it would have been like, you have some traction behind that song. It would have been the most important thing to record. But it, but it sort of always felt, and I've heard Al talk about this a little, it's sort of like, we did that, now it's done, and now we're going on to chapter two. Now that's done, now we're going on to chapter three. And I probably either directly or indirectly borrowed a bit of that from that Al philosophy, you know, because they were sort of like our big brothers and like one step ahead of this. But I remember it was very much a conscious decision. We've already done that. Let's do something new, right? Wow. Duh, we should have led with it. We then later, to some degree, realized potentially the error of our ways because it became the most popular song. And I might argue the most popular song we've ever done. We've closed the set with it for the last decade. It gets the best response. You know, we changed the arrangement a bunch, made it much more into an anthem. But at some point, I think we realized that we needed to do that. And we went back into Radio Beat and recorded it again. By luck, when we did the re-record, Husker Du was in town. And they were invited to Radio Beat after 
their show. And so it was a very late session to do vocals. And uh, we, we had the luck of having an, uh, and again, foolishly, uncredited for Scurdu on that version, where if we were doing things, sort of thinking about it like a professional music business, we would have called out, right? Like you can't imagine releasing a song with guest stars now where like featuring isn't like part of the title, right? Think about like how you look at things at Spotify. And again, in the in the great mistake of like, you know, teenagers trying to figure out how to like make records and break every rule of the record business, even if those rules might have benefited you, uh, Husker Du was uncredited for decades on that song. No, is that because of Lou? Were they already working with Lou at that time? I can't remember. I don't think they, they might have been or it was very early, but, it, you know, those those days where everybody would help anybody. Right. Yeah. Like nobody, nobody had ego. Nobody thought they were bigger or better than anybody else. Like, oh, you want to come to the studio and help? Sure. We'll come to the studio and help. And one of my funniest memories from those days is, you know, all this mythology of the Boston crew had become what it was. And I remember them sitting around the studio asking questions like, so we hear like if somebody has a beer in their hand at a show, it's going to get slapped out of their hand. Or like if somebody shows up at a show with long hair, someone's going to hold them down and shave their head. Is that true? Like they had heard these stories. And if you remember, Husker Du, it sort of like paved their own road, you know, and even then, you know, they had sort of shoulder length hair and, you know, were not straight edge. And they they had heard this mythology and they were they were legitimately asking of like, will these things happen to us in Boston? Yeah. <laughs> I was asking the same question myself at that time. <laughs> uh, getting back to Wolfpack for a second, I had Jamie and Chris on the on the show recently, and um, we were talking. I can't. I'm not sure if it was on or off when we were recording, and we all we agreed that Wolfpack and Glue were like the two most important, like kind of Boston Crew songs at that time. So that's what makes it even more strange almost to look back at it but i understand you guys were young so how would you how would you know first of all you know how did any of us know that we'd be talking about this 40 years later i would have had no idea at all i mean it, it's funny i think there are a lot of songs from that era for a lot of different reasons that are important for a lot of different reasons you, you know like if you were on if you were not in the straight edge song you know side like songs like alcohol for gangrene were like you know bigger than wolfpack and glue arguably would ever be but that was like down a whole different message road right but i guess if you're talking about sort of core boston the crew, crew core yeah. straight edge you, you know i i'd say the those two songs plus chokes infamous straight edge chant <laughs> you, you know sort of became sort of be, sort of became the the anthems and, and i will say to your point about 40 years later like it, it wolfpack has become our closing song for the last decade it gets the best response of the night we've changed the arrangement to sort of make it more anthemic and make it more of a set closer like you know for anybody who was there in revere you know there's kind of like a big breakdown in the middle and we kind of take it out with multiple choruses like sort of again and we talked about this last time was on the way like we didn't approach songwriting like songwriters right and now some of us have gone back a little bit and said like how should this probably have actually been done and i'm going to drop another little nugget here which is you know we had actually we'd actually recorded a 40th anniversary of wolfpack too and with a lot of surprise guest artists and the new arrangement and the only things that remained to be done on it were Dave's vocals. And part of the plan around this whole anniversary cycle was to release that. And that obviously sits, it's unfinished as well. And I'm, I'm hoping Ooh. that Dave recovers to the point where I'm hoping Dave recovers to the point where he can, he can finish that. That's interesting. Um, I got to ask you another question about what something you said, the straight edge chant. I, Jamie and Chris told me that the first time that happened was at CBGB's in New York. Were you, you must've been there, right? I was there. I think they're wrong about CBGB's. My recollection was the first time it was done was at the original rock hotel at the Ritz. Okay. Maybe, and... I'm wrong. maybe it was New York and I got the venue wrong. It was absolutely New York, you know, and I think we've all talked to death about sort of like how, you know, the way sports teams have rivalries, we used to antagonize each other, right? And, you know, New York was sort of a no-edge scene and Boston was a straight-edge scene, especially around like, you know, SSD and DYS. And so I can't remember where in the set it happened for SSD, 
But, you know, Choke gets up on the stage and Springer hands in the microphone. And, you know, he says something. These are not his exact words. Like, you know, Boston crew represent or, you know, he was probably like Boston crew fall in because it's kind of like a Marines thing. And the Boston crew comes up out of the pit on the audience, you know, out of the audience onto the stage and choke leads the chant, you know, which is eventually put on a slap shot record. You know, Boston masses are ripping us down. Don't smoke, don't drink, don't fuck around. Kill anyone with a beer in the hand. Cause if you drink, you're not a man. Say straight edge, straight edge, straight edge in your face. Straight edge, straight edge, straight edge in your face. You don't belong in the human race. And then Boston crew fall out. And everybody goes off and SSD goes in. And New York was very much into like circle slamming at that point. And our thing was like, go the other way. Right. So imagine like there's this big New York circle pit. Let's say it's going clockwise. Boston crew fall out counterclockwise. Wow. That was a nice job, by the way, on that chant. <laughs> that was good, man. What's was crazy. Good. I can remember it. I know. Wow. Okay. Lead, lead us up to the recording. I know I, I got off the track here, but I have to ask these things to you because I love, you have great explanations for everything, Jonathan. I, I, I love talking to you. Um, tell what made you decide, you know, radio beat Lou Giordano. How did that all come together? Well, I would like to say it was part of some grand plan. But here's the funny thing about where we were at that point in time and our level of experience. There basically was no studio that we knew about besides Radio Beat. There was basically no producers who would touch hardcore that we knew about except for the people at Radio Beat. It was Jimmy, and I can't remember his last name, and Lou Giordano. Lou Giordano of then was not the Lou Giordano he became, right? The sort of like, you know, epic sound man you know, sort of post-hardcore. Like, if you really think about the height of Lou's fame, it was sort of like post-hardcore, right? You yeah. know, sort of noisy-based post-hardcore. But he was not famous. He was like Jimmy's assistant's the wrong word. It's not giving him enough credit, but it was Jimmy's studio, and Lou worked for Jimmy. And that is where the sessions for a lot of bands did Boston Not L.A., which is probably the only reason we knew about it. That's where Decadence did Slam, right? So I had a little experience in that room from doing slam so this is my second recording experience ever in the same room i'd been in before with the same cast of characters behind the board and a different cast of characters you know in the tracking room but like it we didn't have any other options at that point as funny as it sounds you know like ssd went on and tried it, a bunch of other things but you know, I think about even like how we went off and did our second record, you know, in a much more sophisticated 16 track room, you know, with like a rhythm section from a dance band as our producers. Right. You know, or how, you know, some of the other bands went off into like 24 track rooms. Right. That was the only alternative available. We knew nothing else. The universe Did I lose you? Hello? No, no. Did I lose you? I, I'm oh, sorry. That I'll, was the uh, delay. Since you, do I... some editing, since you do some editing, I'll do it again. So I was like, so, you know, well, other options appeared later for bands like ours. At that point, the available universe was like one studio, one set of characters, <laughs> one room. We knew nothing else. I like what you said about the uh, rhythm section of a dance band. Are you referring to Alvin Long by any chance? <laughs> I was. And I think those two guys did an incredible job. And, and by the way, here's the difference. And I don't say this as a, as a diss to anybody. Right. But like the difference between recording Brotherhood and recording the second record is like we did pre-production with Alvin. Like Alvin was in the rehearsal room going like, why did you change sections there? Or is that the right tempo? Or, you know, and there was none of that for Brotherhood. You know, like those those songs had been you know, road tested would be an exaggeration, but those songs had been played live, potentially played live in other cities. And, but there was working with, with Lou and Jimmy there, there was kind of at that stage, no discussion really about arrangements. There was, you know, discussion about sounds. Um, and I definitely remember struggling. I, I still don't feel we ever got the right guitar sound on that record, but uh, you know, there, there, there was discussion of sounds of sonics and, and Lou really was a, an engineer more than a producer. And again, I say that with in, in a non pejorative way. I mean, he really, that, that was really his, his, 
specialty, his sweet spot. But, uh, you, you know, so very little pre production, no pre production, very little thought about production. You, you know, we're all unsophisticated. You know, there's not a lot of like, are you guys in the pocket there? Or like, can you pull back on that? You know, it's just, we're literally just trying to get through without mistakes. Like that's the level of recording, right? Like, like the playback is like, was there a horrible, horrible mistake? <laughs> right. It, it doesn't go much deeper than that. Like what was the groove? What was the pocket? You know, like. Do you remember how long you spent in the studio on that record? I want to say we tracked for t parts of two days versus one, right. That we didn't have to all get it done in one day. I remember, you, you know, I think the process at that point was like track everybody together in a live room for the basic tracks, do some overdubs, do vocals separately, mix as separate steps, I believe. I'm holding a copy of uh, Brotherhood. It's obviously not the original copy. It's a, it's a reissue. But I wanted to ask you about the song Stand Proud, because that's okay. yours, right? And I'm holding a copy of the 40th anniversary. You'll have to go on YouTube if you're listening to to watch this section of it. <laughs> Out on January 12th on Bridge Nine. <laughs> um, Stand Proud, that's yours, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I don't even remember how much we, you know, delineated songwriting. Dave Smalley was the primary songwriter at that point. Everybody contributed something to everything, whether it was arrangement. But uh, let's let's say either the lyrics or the basic idea of that song or whatever were were mine. Yes. Yeah, it's a pretty heavy song, man. I mean, you were only like, were you like 15? 14, yes. 15, 15. I was probably 15. I don't care if you hate my kind. It's my decision. It, it, it was my mind. No one to pressure. I had the choice. United together. Youth with a voice. It's pretty epic, man, for a 15-year-old kid to write, you know? And, you know, not taking anything away from Dave Smalley's lyrics, of course. <laughs> Dave Smalley's lyrics are great. I mean, here's the funny thing about a band that lasts this long. We have probably gone through every permutation. So if I think about, you know, if I go to like Brotherhood, Brotherhood, almost everything is like Dave Smalley music, Dave Smalley lyrics, right? With a couple of exceptions, like you call out. You go to the second record, it's DYS music, Dave Smalley lyrics. When you get into post reunion DYS, it was, I became the primary lyricist. Like if you think about like anything post reunion, I believe I wrote 100% of the lyrics. Really? Wow. Really? That's fantastic. Smalley didn't always write all the songs and all the bands he was in as the as time went on, which is a surprise to me. I'm sure he did all the lyrics in Down by Law, but I know he didn't do the original Dag Nasty lyrics and stuff. Um, well, that's – so do you feel the, your songwriting – I'm getting off the topic again, forgive me. Do you feel like your songwriting is expanded? Is that why you're more involved with the lyrics and now than you were then? I mean, you know, we talked about this a little bit before. It's like skiing behind people who are better than you are. You know, I spent a decade, you know, not just with Dave. You know, when Dave and I started, we were neophytes, right? Neither one of us had done anything – ever and when i sort of reunite with dave in 2009 dave's done thousands of shows with dag nasty with brian baker as a partner you know with like all with like bill stevenson and egerton as a partner you know with like sam williams in you know down by law he's done ten thousand shows right so he's a completely different person Braun Stahl, thousands of scream shows a couple of years in the foo fighters you know, Alpahanish, Platinum Record, Berkeley Graduate, you know, tour stadiums of Metallica in, you know, Power Man 5000. And Adam Porras, another Berkeley grad, you know, one of the great technical guitar players I know. I'm skiing with people much, 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 much better than I am. So in the last decade, I would say my understanding of a lot of things musical has changed radically, not because I've changed as a person, because I've been skiing behind much, much, much better skiers than I ever skied behind before. I have a completely different understanding of, you know, arrangement, song structure, all that stuff because of the talent 
I've been fortunate enough to be surrounded by, not because of any inane natural ability. You know, even behind the scenes, like I was, people would always say to me, you want to be successful, surround yourself with talent. <laughs> that, that's Stepping outside of music, that's if you're starting a company, you know, who the first 10 employees are, are a huge indicator of your success or not. Like, you're right, you have to be surrounded by as much talent as you can in, in every facet of your life, whether that's your life partner in co-parenting or the person you're going on the road with or the person you're starting a company with. It's 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 the special sauce for sure. Um, another thing I like about you, Jonathan, is uh, you send me uh, bullets, bullet, uh, what, what am I looking for? Like you send me notes <laughs> before no one ever <laughs> did. That. You did it on the the first time we met. Uh, we, we did a show together. Now you did it again. So I'm going to look at your notes. Here. Well, well, it's funny because it's like I've spent, you know, 20 years as a businessman and I'm used to like sending like bullet the points agenda before the the agenda before the meeting right so yeah. I, it's it's now carried over into like you know if i if i do press or i do a podcast i'm like i'm gonna send you an agenda yeah bullet points is what i was trying to say before yeah. um you mentioned this and i was going to bring this up uh selling out pressing number one but not pressing it again why well it's it's really funny uh I, again i you know a you're talking about having Chris and Jamie on the show. I couldn't be more thrilled to see the incredible response that their re-releases got. And, you know, the, the, the fandom from around the world that fed in. But one of the things that led me to send you that bullet point is, I, I can't remember if it was an Al interview, but, you know, they, they sort of said, Al's like we pressed, you know, a thousand of them or whatever it was, and that was it, and we never went back. And he said, because we were already on to get it away, right? So there was no thought about like keeping the old thing in stock, right? It was just like, we're on to something else. And my guess is like, that was probably either we'd reached the same place from a parallel perspective, or that was the prevailing philosophy, or literally Al said it. So we were just like, yeah, let's, yeah, we'll do it that way, right? But it's this idea of this forward momentum and not going back, which is again, just like, I respect it in terms of like, we're always trying to move forward and I, I get the philosophy behind it, but it, to some degree, you're, you're actually not servicing your fan, right? That it's like, it, in a weird way, it becomes a selfish, becomes a selfish decision. Like there's somebody that wants something and you're saying, I don't really care if you want it. I'm not going to give it to you, right? I'm onto something else. Obviously we don't live in that world now with, with streaming and digital files, right? Where things are perpetually in press. Right. You never have to worry about that. But uh, but yeah, I think we were just on to the next. Right. Yeah, you because, know, you know, there is it. It's not like we couldn't have found, you know, the two thousand dollars to press another thousand of them. Right. It was just like <laughs> we're on to the next. And now, you know, if you have a copy of that, it's worth, you know, I think the cheapest one I saw was three fifty. <laughs> well, the, the funny thing that I never realized until Al said this we actually pressed twice as many brotherhoods as initially as, as, uh, as SSD's first record was pressed. Wow. That's incredible, man. I had um, no idea until Al said, until Al said the number. Going back to what I mentioned before about, did you think we'd be here in 40 years? Um, now I know, you know, with trust and bridge nine and all these labels, um, was it always bridge nine, by the way, that, that you guys were going to do it with, or were there other labels also trying to get you to redo brotherhood with them? I would in no way say we had the level of interest that SSD did. Right. So it's not like, you know, I think probably everybody in the world wanted that the rights to the SSD record. We, we talked to a bunch of different people just sort of based around timing. I mean, here's the great irony of the world. Like my, my wife tries to teach me this, my, 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 my wife's a longtime sober person, and she always talks about, like, you have to give these decisions over to God, right? It's very hard, like, this is the center of, like, sober philosophy, right? Like, you, you just have, God makes the decisions, you can't control life. I'm a business person, this is where we clash. I, I think I can control everything. And so what was really important to me is that the 40th anniversary record come out in the 40th year, right? And some of the other options we had would have had it come out in the 41st year. And I honestly, I mean, A, we've been working with Bridge Nine since 2009, and yeah. I can't say enough 
about Chris Wren as an operator, as a fan, as a supporter of the scene, as a believer in the scene, as a business person. I've got mad respect for him. He's a great operator. He's an honest partner, which is very, very hard to find in this business. So I don't in any way want people to think that like it just came down to timing, right? Because I, I want my partner to be triple A. And I think he did a triple A job with our merch deal. I think he did a triple A job with our live record. He, he, you know, he's been transparent. He's been supportive. So it was a combination of those two things. But going back to my point about how you can't control everything and you have to give things over to God, this record was supposed to come out in 2023 because of Dave's illness and our having to cancel the shows. We had to move the launch date twice because we kept hoping if we moved it, we could get Dave's participation. We could do the shows. And finally it couldn't. And this goes to how Chris is a great partner. You know, we had to push it to 2024 and I was like, I was like, bro, you got to do me a favor. This, the 40th anniversary year is really important to me. Can we start pre-orders in 2023, right? So at least it like makes sense. And of course he was willing to do that. And we started pre-orders on like December 22nd of last year. So at least you could, at least you could order the record in the 40th year. But that was learning about what my wife's always trying to teach me. I tried to control the whole thing, right? And I couldn't. Like God had a different plan, right? God had a different plan for Dave. And I'm not saying this is like a super religious person, right? But it's like, there was a there was a plan and I couldn't, as much as I think that you can, wrestle it to the ground and have it your way. This um, anniversary pressing compiles uh, both sides of the album as well as the song Wolfpack onto a single-sided LP with a screen-printed B-side the it's a it's a thousand copies available from bridge nine two colors 300 clear 700 translucent <laughs> i had to practice that word translucent red um wow so it's coming out this show is going to basically come out right around the time that the record's being released on january 12th so this worked yes, out. And, right. the, and the the clear is the clear is gone, unfortunately. Gone. Um, I if you want to do some sort of giveaway with your audience, if you want to figure it out, I am donating one copy of the clear, the last copy of the clear, because it's sold out to you and your show to do with what as you please with your with your listeners and your viewers and fans. So oh, you can come on the show every week from now on, Jonathan. You know. And <laughs> For you, one wow. test pressing special. Really? So I'm gonna make. I'm yeah. So I'm gonna mail you one test pressing for you. There's only forty of those with this special 40th anniversary sleeve, and I'm gonna send a clear copy to you for your listeners. Wow! Wow! To Thank figure you. out how you can figure out how how your listeners get that. Since it's I don't sold know out, how much get it. it's ringing already to get caught. <laughs> <laughs> that's but thanks. you know you guys have been a great platform you do a great job supporting the scene so i want to support you and the listeners and the fans and, and I'll, I'll do that so yeah i mean you talk about it so we changed it up right it, it was funny and again i'll go back to chris so chris wren came to me and he's like you know we we're trying to think about what the package should be right that's unique because let's say i'm gonna put this somewhat politely there have been some unauthorized reissues of this record packaged in ways that I may or may not have wanted it to be packaged. And we for sure have been paid for none of them. And it was important that this package stand out from the unapproved versions and the myriad of various reissues that have been out there in the world. And Chris sort of came back to me and he gets hundred percent of the credit and says, you know, dude, Record's only 17 minutes long. That means we can press it all on one side and do a picture on the other. And that way it's actually radically different from any version that's come before. And, you know, because before that, I sort of said we got to stamp it in some way. And so this was sort of my contribution, right? Which is like in some way we got to say the whole thing's different. But then he came up with this much bigger, much more creative idea and designed the whole thing. 
The other funny thing that we did is we did a, a big cleanup on the back. And when I say about a cleanup is, so for people that didn't live in the world before a computer, all this little fine type was hand set, right? With like hand set type. And because we were all kids, everybody involved, Bridget Burpee designed this cover, who also designed the SSD covers. We were like, why is that italicized and nothing else like that is italicized? Right. Or like, why is that bold? And nothing else like that is bold. Like there was just little mistakes. <laughs> and so and at a teeny level, we unified all that type in terms of like, you may find that this world is italicized in the old version, but it's the only word like that that's not italicized. And so we just we tried to just clean it up a little. There were a couple of spelling errors, it, it, you know, but but it's, it's teeny, teeny, teeny little plastic surgery. But uh, this is this is the attention to detail that everything that Chris and Bridge Nine does in it, and, and I'm you know I'm the kind of person that I I enjoy. Some people like to leave things in amber, and they think it's really important to leave it the way it was uh, created. I, I I'm more of a believer in like I'd like to I like to go back and polish. Like if if I made a foolish mistake, I like to acknowledge that foolish mistake and go back and correct it. And so th there's a number of teeny you know find waldo level corrections throughout the sort of package you know the big idea of printing it on one side and having a picture disc on the other i know we talked about wolfpack before but so there's a newer version on this record no the version on this record is the husker du version oh the radio well, yeah what i had sort of said is sitting in the can waiting for nothing but dave's vocals which again we had planned to put out uh, really, you know, we were going to drop it the week of the shows is sort of a 40th anniversary, which is the version of this, which is what the song has become over the last decade, which is longer, more anthemic. I would argue more, more dynamic, right? It comes up, it goes down and again for anybody that's sort of seen us, right? It's kind of Dave does a whole exit talk through and then it comes out instead of just being like chorus out, it's like, chorus 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 out like build 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 out right again it's just sort of more of like a set closer and I, and I don't want to drop them now but there's some interesting uh guest stars on it in addition to the the changes in arrangement hmm. and that that original version was only a minute and nine seconds right yeah I think the new one is like again it's not crazy 240 250 Wow. You you can you know, what you can hear is if you get if you get to the live you know for anybody who has the live record on, on Bridge Nine, that's the live version. It continued to evolve a little, but if, if you have the Bridge Nine live record, we closed the, the set with that. In the middle, it sort of breaks down, right? It just goes back to bass and drums, and Dave's like, you know, talks over it, how he's so happy to be there, and then it's like chorus, chorus out. So it's it's a slightly revised arrangement of what you'd find on the on the live record, but a studio version. Tell me about the riff for that song. Who came up with that riff? That's to Dave Smalley. Really? Yeah. So, so did he just have it? So he was playing a guitar. He just had a guitar and he came up with the riff or did he tell Andy how he wanted him to play it or you or? He plunked it out on my bass because I'm a lefty. He plunked it out on my bass, turned upside down in the rehearsal room. Wow. That's incredible. Ugh. That is really incredible. That song has like withstood, withstood the the test of time. It's just such a great. It's like almost like a metal tune, you know. It it you don't know. It's hardcore. It's metal. It's just in your yeah. face. I love it, man. Love it. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm I'm a little excited right now. No, thank you. I mean, I've said this before. I said this the last time. Like Dave Smalley is is like an American punk rock gift, you know, like. During his illness, I, you know, I, I have I'm a big Spotify in the gym person, and and just given how their algorithm works, a lot of Dave Smalley's work works its way through my algorithm. And and during his illness, if these songs would come up, I'd be like, "Oh my god, this song is so good!" And I'd keep forwarding it to him, like especially around the Dag Canon, right? Like a Dag song would come up, and I'd be like, and I just I just forward the track to Dave, and I'd be like, I'd be like this, like you don't know how good you are. Right. And just trying to like keep his spirits up. And, and I was just, I was texting with, with Brian Baker recently and, and sort of like telling him that, right. I was sort of telling Brian, like, I think you and Dave is a partnership with the pinnacle of his musical career. But I just remember like, 
you know, the, these DAG songs would come across my, you know, come through my earbuds at the gym. And I just, before it in the day of like, you don't know like how good you are, right? Like, this, you know, you don't know how good this song is. Like, you know, when you're feeling down in your hospital bed, like you created this. And it, I would just try to give them a constant string of like, and it'd be like all songs, DAG songs, you know, down by law songs. Like, you know, I, if somebody ever wanted to do like, the best of Dave Smalley playlist and like the top 10 songs he's been a writer or co-writer on. I think it would hold up with anybody's. I, I do. I've done that already. <laughs> I'm a huge fan <laughs> of Dave's, you know, yeah. the, uh, I put him right up there as one of the greatest, you know, punk hardcore singers. He's right at the top of the list, especially as far as Americans go. He's right at the top yeah. of the list. I've always loved, you know, the, you mentioned Dag Nasty. Uh, you know, I love talking about them, obviously. And um, the two records that they made that they never toured on or never did anything with are amazing. That the, the, when they just they're went, so good. Those later two records in the '90s are amazing. A lot of the stuff that I was feeding Dave, you know, during this that I was talking about are off those two records, right? Ghosts. It's like, that song "Ghosts" comes into my head yeah. all the time. What a great song! I mean, I mean, that was just. I mean, you know. Brian's canon again, like Dave's will hang with anybody's right. You know, like from, you know, and I know people gave him a bunch of shit, but like junkyards still in my regular rotation and, you know, as part of the cultural zeitgeist, like I remember, so I, I hadn't lived in LA yet. You were probably living in LA. And I remember, and I don't say this to embarrass Brian, cause I wanted to be the kind of rock star that Brian was. And I remember coming to LA to visit Dave, right. And Dave's living in Venice. Um, with with caroline who is his wife of you know 20 years and i go to visit them we go have pancakes at some place we probably go to duke's on sunset you remember duke's yeah, yeah yeah we probably go to duke's on sunset and we meet brian and brian's in dag nasty and brian pulls up in a dodge challenger right muscle car dodge challenger and brian gets out and he's wearing a straw cowboy hat and a wife beater and overalls and he's all tatted up now and you know as we talked about like my love has always been like where punk rock meets rock and roll meets you know i'm not i'm not a punk purist and i was like brian baker's made it how can i be i how could i how could i end up half as cool as brian baker <laughs> you know i had chris gates on the show recently and he played in you know from the big boys yeah totally him and Bra we talked about that. You know, I, I I went to a bunch of junkyard shows. That's when I was hanging out with Brian the most, actually. Yeah. For that period of time, 89, 90, I believe that was. And that's when Down by Law was happening, too. There was a lot going on during that time in L.A. You know, it was like the beginnings of things, you know. I agree and it was the beginning of, like, to your point, like, where our friends were, like, having careers with music, right? Like, I think until, like, you know as great as dad was like, they couldn't live off that. You know what I mean? Right. And I think like 89, 90, you know, like we started to have friends who could like, who came from punk rock, who could like live off music. Yeah. It's funny, you know, because a lot of things that happened going all the way back 40 years, it happened with other bands too. Like when I, when day, you know, field day, for example, the field day record, when that came out, a lot of people dissed that record and said, oh, they went all commercial and everything. You know, Peter Courtney was the singer now. Yeah. Now everybody wants that record, man. Everybody wants that record re-released. It's like, that record was great. I'm like, you didn't say that then, you know? It's like, everything is like, the, there was so many good things that came out of the hardcore scene that people can never underestimate that that part of our lives the early 80s set the tone for so much so much it, it did but I, but again i think you hit the point where it sort of hit its pinnacle in the late 80s and early 90s because i think i think we talked about this before the great thing about diy is there was no gatekeepers but the bad thing about diy is there were no gatekeepers meaning there was nobody grooming you to a yeah. certain level before it was exposed to the world right and i sort of feel by like 88 or 90 people had sort of got their ten thousand hours right like people had sort of like self-taught their way to like a good arrangement and good songwriting and good production and, and it was like it sort of felt like to that to me that era was like the people who stuck it out were getting the payback for sticking it out right yeah. we're getting like the positive I payback agree. 
and at 22 or whatever you knew and you knew what you didn't know at 15 right you know so there's not going to be very many copies of this record available after all the pre -orders. Well, I mean, here, here's the thing. The mistake we won't, you know, we'll, they'll do something different. But, like, if this sells out, we will print another printing, right? You know, maybe it'll be on – you know, it was, it was funny. Like, you know, it's translucent red because, again, I, I you know, we're just sort of trying to think like – I try to think like a marketer. Like, 40 years is actually ruby. Like, if you go to, like, the anniversary. So, like, the red is supposed to be ruby for 40th, right? So, you know, I don't know. So – Maybe there'll be a black one. Maybe there'll be another one if they sell if they sell out. But uh, we'll 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 keep it in press for sure. We will we we will try not to make the same mistake twice that we made before. I think we covered all your bullet points except for the benefit <laughs> show that might. I don't mind. Well, we, to, we we talked about it. <laughs> I wish you were my producer and you talked to all my guests and told them to come up with bullet points before they come on the show. It would make my life easier. Um, yeah. So, so at this point, the the the, the benefit show is is TBD. You, you, you know, I, I want to gauge sort of Dave's comfort level around it. That's the most important thing. You know, he's kind of back on the men, but he's going to need a significant amount of time to get back on his feet. But what I I hope to turn it into more back to what we've talked about is really it's ego list to me. It's about it's going to be about helping Dave, and you know if I if I wanted to take the big swing in my head, the show that I would picture would be you know a celebration of what dave's brought to hardcore and punk and music as opposed to like yeah i don't want to like turn it into a dys marketing beat you know what i mean like like ultimately if it's the best thing for dave to have this benefit show i will work my ass off as his friend of 40 years to help get it done and participate to the level that makes sense but you know I, i'm not calling like a date or a time or a whatever now but yeah. you know if if somebody if he needs my help i'm there for him in any way shape or form i know he's in a lot of our thoughts because i've talked to a lot of people lately and we're all thinking about dave and hopefully he will recover and be i'd love yes, to see and, him on stage and, again yes and, and you know and i've said this to him so i'm not talking out of school i think the mistake he sort of made in this is he he just tried to keep it all inside and try to keep it all personal. And I think he could have benefited from sharing more of it, you know, because I think other people go through this stuff and hearing that other people are going through it is, is, is helpful. And I think it would have been helpful for him instead of to do this all privately and secretly and alone, you know, even to some degree, I didn't know how bad it was for a long time. You know, he was even keeping it from me. That like to hear from your fans, like how much you mean to them. I think it's helpful in times like this. Jonathan, thank you. I love talking. Thank to you, you for, for this platform. I love talking to you. All right, man. All Take right. Care. Thank you.